for parenting know that there are times that if you have a parent, it may be in your memory the time when you were around 9 or 10, and you would say, why do I have to do this? Dad, I don't understand. Why do I got to do this? And Dad would say what? Because I told you so. Because I said so. Because this is the way it is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as our Rabb is in this position a thousand times. That Allah ta'ala is in this authoritative position where he tells us, tells us, not suggest, not recommends, but commands. Look at how Allah talks to us in the Quran. Inna Allah ya'muru bil adil. The verse of justice, Allah Ta'ala says He commands it. He doesn't say, you know, it might be a good idea if you are just. He doesn't say, I would suggest, I know you have your thoughts about it, but this is what I think. No, Allah Ta'ala commands. Because He is in a position to command. He is the Rabb, and we are the Marbu. He is the Creator, and we are the Creative. He is the guardian, and we are the ones that he protects. This is basic aqeer. I mean, if you have a problem with this in any way, if I have a problem with this in any way, I have to go and I have to reread what it means for me to be Muslim. Because when I say that I'm a Muslim, I am saying I'm surrendering to Allah. You read all kinds of definitions, self-surrender, submission, uh, all of these definitions point to the same thing, that Allah is the Rabb, and we are those who are under him. So Allah gets to tell us what to do. Even those of us that don't want nobody telling them what to do, Allah gets to tell you what to do. So when you read the Quran, you're not reading the Quran, or you shouldn't, as if you have a stake in how this conversation goes. Because this conversation is always a superior talking to someone who's under them. And we should have no problem with this. If we understand what it means to believe in God, we won't have a problem with this. It's very important to refresh this understanding. Because when we talk about purification of the heart, one of the first things that we have to deal with is our innate nature, our, our tendency to want to engage in battles, these intellectual gymnastics that we often engage in. Because we have intellect. We're not like animals. We can think. We can process. But we have to understand that there's a difference between the workings of my limited mind and my understanding and the all-knowing nature of Allah's knowledge. So when Allah speaks to me in the Qur'an, this is what humbles me. And if I read the Qur'an with arrogance, like I'm going to find a mistake. There are people who read the Qur'an this way, by the way. There are books on the market, you know, the mistakes of the Qur'an. What's wrong with the Qur'an? What's wrong with Islam? And all of these books are based on the reading of a person who comes from a place of disbelief. So they start with the assumption that the Quran has nothing to tell them. They're going to approach the Quran the way they would approach any other piece of literature. And, uh, you know, critically think about it and give their version or their opinion. But the Qur'an is not this. Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka liyadabbaru ayatihi wa liyatadakkara ulul anbaab. Allah tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the purpose of the book, Kitab anzalnahu ilayk, we revealed it to you, liyadabbaru ayatihi in order that they may reflect upon the verses, ponder upon them. 
ponder upon the verses. And so that the people of sound intellect may remember. Right? So that means that when you sit with the Quran, you have to sit with your heart. Because your intellect will work. This is a natural thing. Your intellect will work. What does this mean? What does that mean? What does this mean in this context? But then the heart is what matters most. And so you approach the Quran with a heart of surrender. Allah tried it my way. Now show me. Is an example of that heart of surrender. I tried it my way. Wallahi, I tried it my way. And then you have you gotta surrender. This is what Islam literally means. Literally. When Allah Ta'ala says, Wa tasimu bihablillah, and hold steadfast to the work of Allah. The metaphor is the first thing is the book. Without the book, you have nothing, no guidance. You're wandering around. You're trying to figure it out as you go along. And all of these things, as a human being, you have the permission of Allah to do. You have a, the permission of Allah to say, no, I don't want the guidance. This is the difference between you, Bani Adam, and all of the rest of Allah's creation. All of the rest of Allah's creation all of them, the greatest of creation, nature, all of these things, they have ikra. They are compelled. They must function according to the specific design that Allah made for them. They don't have a way to alter the plan. But Benny Adam, we have a way to alter the plan because we have intellect. You can think about stuff. This is why Allah calls you to think and to reflect. This is why the Quran, when you read it, you have to think about what you're reading because Allah is talking to you. This is what Imam Anas means when he says it's a personal engagement. Those verses are not for anybody else in that moment but you. So when you read the story of Musa the story of Isa the story of Joseph, Yusuf, look at the fitna of Yusuf from when he was a little boy. That is a real to life story. A real to life Human beings who came from a prophet, a household of prophethood. Because the, the, the household that Yusuf grew up in was a household of prophethood, Beit Nabur. And look, Allah tells you, read this story and see what happened. Yusuf ended up a prophet. Before he became a prophet, what happened to him? His own blood brothers. Betrayed him. Then he was wrongly accused. Then what? For let me that me build the ICE. Then he was thrown in jail on a false accusation. Because Yusuf really didn't do it. But he was in jail. He had the same jail. And it wasn't until later on that he became prophet. All of this is in the Quran for a reason. Right? So you have to think about what you're reading. And it is, it is absolutely important today, brothers and sisters, that we think about what we are reading, how we are living. Because these are days of reflection. And I'm not saying this in any type of apocalyptic sense. I'm saying this in the sense of what you and I, if we were to have a conversation after the prayer, 
and if we were to talk about the politics of the time, you and I would have a discussion about a time when things are uneasy. There's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of oppression. There's oppression that we are witnessing, that we hear about, that we can do nothing about. But we may still feel the pain. There is all forms of corruption. There's all types of things going on. And one of the things about the time that we're living in right now is that it's coming from the very highest offices of the country sometimes. And so we ponder what's going on here, or we should. Because this stuff is having real to life effects on people. Almost every person I talk to in a given week, it's like we're talking about what's wrong. There's some things wrong so socially, there's some things wrong culturally, and there's definitely some things wrong, and probably in the first instance, spiritually. Because when people continue to turn their back on God, that cannot have a good outcome. We have the right to do it because Allah gave you the right. Now you can all have a deal. There's no, unlike the inanimate objects, there's no compulsion in religion. Not even for you, brother. Not even for you, sister. Nobody can make you Muslim. Nobody can make you be Muslim. Nobody can make you follow Islam. Nobody can make you obey Allah. But you can make yourself do that. So then you have a choice. La ikraha kiddin. A lot of people use this verse just for non-belief. Oh no, no, even for the Muslims. You can't make someone be a Muslim. And that's another conversation because the implications are, there's some other implications of that. But these are the days where we have to begin to Take a hard look. Where are we now? And where are we going? Where's all this stuff going? And if we are ominous about the direction of where some of this stuff is going, what is the plan? Always when you come to this message, you should know that inshallah time that we will not present a problem without making an effort to give you some type of solution to the problem. And so some of the things that I want to say today around the topic of service are rooted in what I just said, how we look at Islam, how we understand our faith in Allah and our belief in Allah. What is it? What is it? What are the essential elements of it? Internally, the surrender is for my soul. Externally, my surrender will show up outside of myself. And one of the ways that it does that is in my service to my fellow human being. Whether I am a manfa'a, and am I of benefit, or am I of baba, malaba, am I of harm? It'll show up. Very important. Why are we repeating these things? Because we are living in a time when we Muslims are exhibiting symptoms of a confused community. We're all over the place. Islam is everything. Islam is anything you want it to be. What is your Islam? My Islam is this. What is your Islam? Well, what is your Islam? But that's not Islam. 
Islam is what Allah says Islam is. We have the challenge of the social situation that we're in. Where it's hard to make a case, you know, the statistics used to reflect that Americans in general were some of the most religious people in the world. Because God was important. That meant if you talk to the Muslim, God is important. If you talk to the Christian, God is important. If you talk to the Jew, God is important. If you talk to the average person who wasn't associated with a, a place of worship, God was important. And now, God has become a lot less important. Also, according to statistics. Because the notion of believing in something outside of yourself that is greater than you, more powerful than you, that you have must surrender to, is becoming a notion that so many people consider laughable. You believe you still believe fairy tales? They say things like fairy tales. It's a fairy tale. I mean, God is a fairy tale. And this is supposed to be an example of intellectual superiority that you conclude that something that you and I cannot handle and prove doesn't exist. And so this idea germinates and it is taken root. And if we're not careful, we can take root in our hearts. That means you can dress up as a Muslim and not be a believer. When I stand up here and I rail on about Philly Islam, it's the result of observing over a period of time a form of Islam that has rooted itself in Philadelphia, in Philly, where you look like a Muslim. Because you got a certain garb on, because you got sunnah, you got a prayer mark. Don't matter if you banged your head against the wall a hundred times put it there. I know about that. So you can have the, it's not from praying. The real prayer mark is from praying. Now you got some dudes do carving the mark on the head so they can display something that is not in their hearts. And well, Lord, he, this is what, I'm not telling you anything that I'm imagining. I'm telling you things that I talk to people about almost every day. And when people come to the restaurant and they come for counseling and they come for advice about life, because you can't live life as a phony, fake person. You can't do that. And so people come, why is, it, you know, why is it my game working for me? I got the throw on, I got this. Yo, what's up with your heart? Because if you're not carrying this around with you 24 7, you really play with it. Because this Islam is not about clothes, although clothes can be important. It's not about your beard and about all this ex external stuff. It's not for, you know, the symbols of the sisters in all black with the faces covered totally. You can't see their face. Brother wants to get married, you know. Okay, I got a nice sister. Where she at that single black thing right there? You talk to her. And I want to see her. You know, you talk to that. And this has become a normative practice. Wallahi, well, people come in a mission, and this is a mission that has a center of the path akida, a, a traditional madhab of fiqh, and we practice a moderate form of fasulum in this masjid, and for some people, we're not real Muslims. I've learned to laugh at that. I used to get mad, like, you crazy. I used to get mad. You were out of your mind. No, 
Now I just laugh. You still have the mind that is funny. <laughs> Why? Because that is, you know, Islam got to be all of this, they got to look a certain way. But what we are discovering is that this is not enough. It can't sustain you, brother. You can't run that race but so far. The race of this high piety that's not in your heart, it's on your back. And it shows up in how you treat yourself. It shows up in how you treat your family. It shows up in how you treat your children. It shows up, brothers, in how we treat one another. Sisters, in how you treat one another. Brothers, how we treat our women. It shows up and it tells on us. And Allah will allow us to see these symptoms of decay. And, and you know, we talk about no progress in the community. But, you know, like, people don't want to look at what they have done, what they are doing. Because Allah will allow us to see it. He tells us it's all around. And so my argument today, brothers and sisters, is that these are not times where we can look to blame other people for our condition. Because there's no pride for me in standing here in front of you and reading Arabic. I read Arabic because I was prepared to read Arabic. I'm not reading Arabic to shine on you or to make me feel, feel any kind of way. There's no pride in telling you stories of the elders and telling you stories that, you know, I'm a second generation, you know, Muslim, and my kids are third generation. All of that doesn't mean a thing if we're not Muslim. Because Allah's not going to ask you about how many generations deep. And the challenge that I see us facing that's real is the challenge of how do we keep the souls, preserve the souls. Because when Allah, I talk to the Muslims who are no longer Muslims anymore. And they grew up Muslim. I, I know about that. And I, I talk to people, send me emails, some of them anonymous. How do I get back involved with my deen? I was raised in Islam. I, I know five Jews of Quran. I know Arabic. I, So this is a serious situation. This is not, this is serious. And then one could argue that if we don't begin to think about how to solve this, the ones who are coming behind are going to do the same thing once they get old enough to do it. Because everybody in this country can make a choice. So a part of the solution to our brothers and sisters is to recapture the, 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 the essence, to start with the essence of the faith. Is faith and living faith. And living faith through serving other people. And that is something that all of us can do. You don't have to be a sheikh. You don't have to be an alim. You don't have to be a mufti, a mulana. You don't have to be master's prepared, PhD, postgraduate. You don't have to be any of that. You just have to be a sincere believer. And there's always something that you can do, not just for your soul, but to help somebody else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Laysa birra an tuwallu wujuhakum qibla al-mashriqi wa al That true faith is not in turning your faces to the east or the west. You've heard this verse before. This verse was revealed in a time when the qibla was one way, and then Allah revealed the command to change the direction of the qibla, and people did what people do. They had a disagreement. Why we gotta change? They asked the prophet this. Well, you told us yesterday to pray this way. 
Now you say and pray that way, I don't know. And Allah Ta'ala was the hakam. He refereed, he said, look, that don't matter. The exact direction of the qibla doesn't matter. What matters is that you pray. And then you are prayerful. So that verse is self-evident because Allah Ta'ala says, True faith is what? That you believe in God. Well, you only ask it, and that you believe that you will be accountable to God. One malaika, you believe in the angels because they're unseen, but they're created by God. One kitab, and you believe in the scripture. One nabiyin, you believe in the prophets. And then Allah says, "Wa'atul mala ala hubi the lukubra wa yatama wa masakin, wa masari wa sa'inin wa fibqal." And then you give uh, what you have earned to help those who have less than you in their categories. Wa aqam al salat, you establish prayer. Wa'atul zakat, and you give the obligatory alms. وَالْمُوفُونَ بِعَهْدِهِمْ إِذَا عَهَدُوا And you keep your word. You say you're going to do something, then do it. Don't have people second guessing you. وَالصَّابِهِينَ فِي الْبَأْسَاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ وَحِينَ الْبَأْسِ And then you persevere. You stick it out because Allah is going to test you. And it's not a, the believer has temerity. The believer has uh, resilience. It is not, a person is not a believer who, when they're afflicted by the most minor thing, oh, I can't take it. I thought, I thought God was going to help me. This, that's not belief. I'm sure we need to serve this for a reason. We didn't know what happened. The people who do of the aforementioned, they are the ones who are truthful in their claim that they are believers. So unless you and me are striving to live our lives this way, we have work to do. And we still have work to do, but we got to try. So these are the days, beloved brothers and sisters, that when we hear this and we acknowledge that there's stuff going on, we have to go back to the basics and say, wait a minute, what am I doing here? What am I doing? And then we have to look at, for our brothers and sisters, our families. We have to look at our community. This is why you hear me challenge. I push back when people tell me in Philly, the Muslims in Philly. I don't know all about the Muslims in Philly. I'm from Philly. I don't know all about. We got numbers. So what? Everybody's all over the place. Doing whatever. So the numbers are of no benefit to us right now. The same way the followers of the Prophet would show up sometime on the physical battlefield and they would be absorbed with their numbers and be obliterated. This is the potential, the danger, if we're not careful. And so this shift in our thinking is a very simple one. If we're willing to look at you know, what do I think Islam is versus, versus what is Islam really? And the idea of rising above your self-interest to the interest of someone else is an essential Islamic ethic. You know how we talk about the Muhajirs, they left Mecca and went to Medina, and we talk about how they did all these all these stories. You got the guy that had a, had a business he gave, one of the companions gave the Muhajir half of his business. All right? We read another story 
uh, the brother had more than one wife, and he gave the brother one of his wives, right? Can I work with you? <laughs> gave the brother one of his wives. He divorced him and killed him. So if you say, oh, man, yeah, I would do that, that, that's what I'm talking No, it's not. Because <laughs> that's, that's a level. And the point is not that you do that exactly. The point is to illustrate that you have to think about the next man. Always. And in a society where we are enculturated to just look out for myself, and as long as I'm good, things are good, all of us can't be this way. We got enough people like that. That as long as they're good, all is good in the world. And not that you fix everything in the world, but you have to have a broader mentality as a believer. Because the prophetic way, the Prophet Sallallahu we know what his sunnah is. We heard the stories of his wife saying that sometimes they would go to sleep and their cupboards were empty. Not because the Prophet Sallallahu championed poverty, but because he championed giving. To the point that he gave everything in his house after his family was fed for the day, he gave it away. Because he knew that tomorrow would come and they would get what they need for tomorrow. And this is why he was a Rasulullah. So I'm not going to say. So, beloved brothers and sisters, these are just some reflections on the, the, the idea of first returning to a, a basic understanding. Because I would argue that we have to undo some damage. Some spiritual damage has been done. Some spiritual damage has been done in the community. And then on top of that damage, there's damage that's already in the environment, especially us brown people, the stuff that we go through. There's traumas. There's traumas all around us. We live with trauma, we inherit trauma. We inflict trauma, there's trauma everywhere for us, right? So we have to also take that into consideration and think about some basic things. And then we have to build a community where we love each other, where we respect each other, where we value each other, where we help each other. And that's not easy work. It's easy talk, but it's hard work. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fortifies us, and strengthens us, and heals us, and helps us to understand these basic ideas. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala return us to an Islam that is sweet, a faith that is deep, and a love for Him and His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that exceeds all love. So I think in the Islam that is spiritually empty. And even if you do vicars, and I'm saying this to us because we do vicar in this mission, right? But the vicar is just one thing. You got to carry the vicar out with you when you leave the mission, right? And the vicar has to inform because the vicar is a reminder. That's all it is. That's what vicar means. It reminds you. Think about what we're saying. La ilaha illallah. 
Ya Allah, Ya Wahid. When we mind, there's no God but God. I don't care what this No God but God. And God is one. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Oh Allah, we ask if you send salutations to our master Muhammad. Abdika wa rasuli and nabi al ummi. Your servant and your messenger. The unlettered prophet. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And you send salutations to his ad, his family, who followed his sunnah. Wa sahbih, his companions, wa sallam. And that we send prayers to them. But it's not enough to do the dhikr if you're not then motivated in some way. It's fuel for your heart to remember. Because it's hard to remember out there. Right? So this practice of Islam that is spiritually empty, we have to challenge it. And we have to fill up the holes with dhikr, with the Qur'an. Because if we are practicing the empty Islam, where the value and the merit of the actions are based upon how they look to people, not how they look to Allah, this is a deep spiritual problem. And we're into impressing one another. And, the, and we're not thinking about the fact as the verse said, you believe that you are accountable to Allah. So all of this performance should be for Allah, not for people. And this starts with your intention, right? And then you add to that that we can't develop as individuals, let alone a community, just on symbols, on clothing, on buildings, on money. We, we can't build ourselves and our families on those things alone. And so, with this in mind, I close with this statement, and I shared it with you before, I want to share it again. One of the great scholars of our time Sheikh Ibrahim Jubbahimullah said, and I heard him say it, that the time is for the focus to be on the believer before the masjid. A sajid qabla masjid. Not that the masjid is not important, but the people who are in the masjid are most important, and their souls are the thing that matters the most. And he said this as a challenge to his colleagues, to fellow scholars and, you know, academicians and, you know, muftin and you were all in the audience. And he said, so this is the challenge. You have to teach Islam this way and move the value from people. Because if you travel the world, there are beautiful messages all over the world. There's beautiful missions all over the United States. I mean, million dollars. All over the United States. You know, the Islamic Center in Washington, D.C. is a showpiece. And in D.C., it was the showpiece until the Turks built the Diana Center of America in Maryland. And that's another showpiece. So the world is full of these showpieces, but what about the people? This is always the driving question. Beloved brothers and sisters, we are a part of that. So inshallah ta'ala, we ask Allah to help us to always keep in mind that there's always something that I can do. Even if I strive as best I can to be a better man, to be a better woman, to be a better father, a better mother, all this stuff matters. Wallahi well, right now, and there's some brothers and sisters who do social work, and I, I believe they will back me up on this. You know, a lot of the counseling that we do with people, people have deep-seated problems, 
There's a lot of mental illness in our community. There's a lot of trauma from childhood stuff that shows up in grown people, adults, because it's unresolved, because we haven't even looked at it. Right? And so this is where the heart of what we have to do. This is where it lies. We ask the Lord to help us in the love of